Well, welcome, guys, to Clinton Anderson Uncut and Real Raw. We're back here for another podcast. But today, I'm going to be interviewing, and she's going to be interviewing, and our guest is Christina. Christina, good to have you here. Thanks, Clinton. I appreciate it. Now, Christina, what's your last name? Liqueur. Liqueur. Very, very hard. Think of the alcohol. I Think know you're familiar alcohol. with that. Think of the alcohol. Well, good. Cheers. Great to have sure. you here. Thanks. So, originally, how we got together is you saw the podcast that I did with the Gage a year or more ago. And you, you have your own podcast okay. and you said, you know, let's get together and be on mine. And I said, well, if we both live in Arkansas and we're close to each other, why not do it here? We can film it. You can use it. I can use it. And then I started checking into your life story and I thought you'd be a great guest to have on mine. So we can kind of kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I found out about the Gage podcast. I know shit all about horses. <laughs> I know nothing about that, but I know a lot about business and I know a lot about mindset. And I listened to the Gage bod podcast. Well, how did you get sent the Gage? If you <laughs> don't have horses you know what my husband's cousin shout out to Dano mm -hmm. his name is Dano he horses uh, put shoes on horses mm -hmm. for a living and he and he's country as hell lives mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere Texas right. he goes you're gonna fucking love this guy he's <laughs> you he's you Christina you have to listen to this podcast and I just kind of thought he was full of shit but I was in the car he sent it to me and I was like probably didn't think I was gonna like it at all 20 minutes in I'm like fucking love this guy. He gets it. He gets it. He's changing the world just in a completely different area or arena than I am. And uh, I was stoked to reach out. I reached out to your team and yes. didn't hear back for like a week. And then all of a sudden they said, you know, you now live in Arkansas. I had no idea where you lived. You mentioned something on that podcast about a New York suit. And I had just assumed you lived in New York. No, I just reason. fly up there to buy them. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought you lived in New York. And then when your team said, let's do it in person, we have a house up here. So it worked out great. One thing I figured out, if it doesn't matter what you're doing in life. If when you track down who's the best and you're willing to get on a plane, you can get it. Absolutely. If you're willing to go travel, which to me, it's never been a big deal traveling. I left high school when I was 15, moved out of home, flew to America when I was 20 with $400. Like traveling to go somewhere has always been second nature to me. But I always get amused that people think that if it's not within two or three hours of where they live, how the hell do they get there? You know, just go to the best people, go to the experts, go to whoever does what you want to do and go learn from them, buy their services. So yeah, I, I like a lot of my suits I get from Brioni in New York and they do an excellent job but that's where New York come from. Yeah, it's so interesting. I totally agree with you. I mean, one of the things that I preach all the time is you are who you surround yourself with. And if you are not around the right people, go fucking find them. Yes. Figure out where they're at. That's and, exactly right. And yeah. So let's get started. So how about uh, half the interview uh, can be you just asking me whatever I want and you just kind of run it like it's your podcast and I'll answer whatever questions I can and do whatever I can. In the second half, I'd like to do the same with you. Absolutely, for sure. Right on. Well, introduce yourself. Tell everyone, because I'm going to say that like 99% of my audience doesn't know who you are. So tell everyone who you um, are. Clinton Anderson, I'm crazy. <laughs> I've had a vasectomy, so we don't need to worry about breathing that on, you know, and a uh, little self-reflection. And uh, I'm from Australia originally, moved here in 1997, I'm 47 now. I retired when I was 43 uh, from the horse industry. I still play with horses and have fun with them, but it's not necessarily what I... I still have my business, but I don't actively run it anymore and really push it the way I used to. Um, and I just... I don't know what else you want me to say, you know? I want to know why you're doing this podcast now. You're retired. I've heard that you wanted to retire. Mm -hmm. Why take on this whole new thing? Why take this on? Um, I thought it would be fun. But my, at my stage in my life, if it's not fun, I'm not fucking doing it, okay? And I, I get to be selfish like that now. But I've also taken it up the ass for 26 years and really paid my dues and slummed it for many, many years. So now it's about having fun. So hopefully I'm going to live long enough to enjoy some of it. But um, I just wanted it to be fun. I didn't want to do a horse podcast. So the vast majority of people I'm going to have on here are going to be somewhat like you, not horse related, not related to me. Um, and uh, people said they really enjoyed the Gage podcast and my mind and business and money and all that kind of stuff. So I, I and they also said that it inspired them to, to do better with money and, and making more and saving it and, re and investing and so forth. So I thought, you know, if I can be a little bit of an inspiration for people in my own world, maybe I can get other people to be an inspiration, not just for me, but other people in the world as well. So the whole idea was to just interview really successful uh, men and women, but mainly men. It was kind of, this podcast is, when I say geared for men, 
it'll be offensive to some women, and I'm okay with that. I'm not worried about that. Fuck it. They got Oprah. You know what I mean? They only got they only got 87 other fucking channels for women. So fuck it, guys. Can we just put one on the motherfucking board? Yeah. Okay. So it's mainly geared to men, but women can enjoy it and have fun if they're not offended by it. But I wanted to originally, and I am doing it, is interview really successful rich men. And, and because they have typically, yeah, you know, life, money, pussy. That is exactly what makes the world go round. Whether you want to admit that or fucking not, that is as simple as it gets. You ladies are sitting on a nuclear fucking weapon and you don't even know it. Oh, no, I know it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Cheers that. No, if I, I had a pussy, I swear to God, I'd be a billionaire. Okay. <laughs> I swear to God, I'd be the richest man in the world if I had a pussy. Okay. So, because men that are self made millionaires and billionaires, you know, Democrats want you to believe that every rich person in the world inherited their money. And the vast majority of people that are very wealthy came from poor. They were dirt fucking poor. They worked their ass off. They took chances. They gambled. They're workaholics. And they made a shit ton of money. So they have a very interesting rags to riches story, uh, which I wanted to enjoy. And I think other people could enjoy it as well. And typically, if you've made a lot of money, you've made a lot of mistakes too. I've made tons of mistakes. I've lost a lot of money. I've made a lot of money. And when you get people talking about money, I, you know, I want to know what are you, some of your greatest successes with money? What are you, some of your biggest fuck, fuck ups with money? If you could go back to a, a 20 year old Clinton, what would you tell yourself now? If you had to coach yourself again with money and, and business and life, what would you tell yourself? And then typically, the third p pillar was pussy because most men that have made a shit ton of money, and myself included, are a fucking train wreck in their personal lives. That's, as a general rule, I know very few people that have made millions and billions that haven't been, I've been divorced twice. Most of them have been divorced two, three, four times. Because when you work that much and you're that focused on your career, I've always said success comes with a price. Typically something else will get fucked up. It's typically marriages, it's typically children, it's typically family. You, you can only focus on one thing at a time. You can't shoot the deer and fucking trim your toenails at the same time. It's either shoot the fucking deer or trim your toenails. You can't do both. So most men that are very successful in business and very successful with money typically are a fucking train wreck when it comes to their personal life. And myself included, and they're funny stories. So when I can get people to sit here and be genuine with me and we can laugh at ourselves and laugh at our own fuck ups, I think the audience can relate to that and enjoy that. You know what I mean? So that was the main goal of it is just to have fun. I only wanna do one of these a month. I don't wanna turn this into a business. It's not uh, meant to make money. It's really just branding, keep people talking. But more than anything, I wanted people to watch my podcast and walk away like, fuck yes, I want to go take something on. I want to win. I want to, you know, I want them to be motivated to do better. And at the same time, if we can laugh at myself, laugh at the guests, laugh at each other, and people can relate to that. And, and, and behind, you know, a lot of people behind the, the gauge said, you know, you said all the shit I was thinking. Most stuff that I say, most people think really. But most people just don't have the balls to fucking say it. But they're all thinking it. That's why they relate it to it so much. So it was just to be fun and enjoyed. I want to do one a month. I don't have any sponsors. I'm self-funding it, but I don't want any sponsors. No, I'm not saying I wouldn't take any, but I don't want to be controlled. I don't want to be censored. I don't want to be told, you can't say that. You can't say this. You got to do this. You got to do that. I, I feel like at my age, like I'm this naughty child that's always in fucking <laughs> time out that everybody keeps controlling. And, I'm, and now a lot of people that are around me now, they've just given up on me. They yeah. said, fuck it. Here's the way that it is and they quit trying to do it, you know what I mean? But that was one of the main reasons why I didn't want to take on sponsors is because I don't want to be told what I can say, what I can't say. I want this to be truly uncut and real rule. That's the whole point of it. If we can't be honest with ourselves and our success stories and our biggest fuck-ups, I don't want to do it. I love it. That's as simple as it gets. I love it. My whole entire brand is decided it's your turn. Decision, faith, and action that will change your life. And I work with all of those guys you're talking about. I work with a lot of men and women. Mm -hmm. But I work with the people who are sick and tired of fucking it all up. They yes. want to figure out how to, like, I don't believe you can have it all, all the time. But mm -hmm. I do believe that there's a way in which you can have a lot of it. And that is what I'm so fucking passionate about. Mm -hmm. I believe every single human, you included, all of us in this room, have a God-given responsibility to use what we have in us. And like yours is 
dirty and vulgar and mm -hmm. loud and all the things. And like, there is someone out there, like even like myself, mm -hmm. when I listened to the podcast, I was like, I love this guy. I love his message. I love the way that you say it because I am so authentic. I'm kind of like you, even though I look like the way that I look right now. <laughs> I am also a huge tomboy. I love to fucking gamble. I love to golf. I cuss like a sailor. I am so passionate. I am literally all of the things that probably don't, I remember I was sitting at a blackjack table in um, Lake Tahoe and I was pretty much looking probably the same way I was and I got, you know, guy fucking draws like 21 or something <laughs> on me. I was like, motherfucker. And he's like, oh my God, I've never seen anyone look like you and say that. And I was like, well, fuck, I just had 20 and you gave me 21. But it's been the key to my success, just mm -hmm. like it's been yours, you know? People are a drawn to genuine and authentic people. So the one thing that most people are frightened to be, which is genuine and authentic, because they think it'll repel people, it actually does the complete Absolutely. opposite. People are, genu are, are attracted to genuine and authentic people. So whatever you are, just be it and embrace whatever it is. And I'm not saying you have to be loud like me or, or whatever. If you're quiet, embrace being quiet. Be quiet. Be whatever you are. And there's no right or wrong to the message. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I have clients who are unbelievably the exact opposite of me. Never say a cuss word. Yeah. You know, like very straight and narrow. But they have all the success in the world because they're being so authentically themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you think has been the massive key to your success? Has it been the fact that you are unwavering or your mm. drive? What is it? In the horse world, I've always said, I'm not very naturally talented at training horses, okay? But I took my negative and turned it into a positive, okay? So I, I have a saying, you know, it's the back of the hand. Your greatest strength in life is also your greatest weakness. So my weakness was I wasn't naturally talented at training animals and training horses, okay? But because I knew that, I had to work really, really hard to overcome that weakness, that natural weakness of mine. So I would probably say the most important thing for my success was work ethic. Just fucking work. You can fuck a lot of things up in life, but if you get that one thing right, get up every day early and work your ass off and go to bed and repeat it, you can't half fuck a lot of things up. Like you can do a really well for yourself if you just get that one thing. No, I always, my mentor Ian Francis has a saying, he says, nobody ever drowns in their own sweat. No, one person's fucking died in their own sweat. So if you had to say what was my greatest success, it was my work ethic. And I got that from my, my parents. I come from very middle class Australia. Uh, there's not a lot of poor people in Australia, not a lot of rich people, very much middle class. So they taught me how to work. And that to me is one of the greatest gifts a parent could give a kid is fucking work ethic. And because if you don't instill it in them, it's very hard for them to get it later in life. They either learn it young and learn it through their early life and teens and carry it on or they won't. So work ethic would be it. Um, and then I've had, now where I have had some natural talent is I've got a good gift of the gab. I can communicate with people, get along with most people, identify a situation. So that I did have a natural gift with. But the, as far as the training the horses, no. But what I did is I took what was a negative for me and turned it into a positive. There are other people that I know that are very naturally, train, uh, naturally talented at training horses, but they're fucking bums. Mm -hmm. They don't have a work ethic. When you really analyze naturally talented people in many sports, the true naturals, not all, but the true naturals typically are lazy. Not all of them, but typically the true naturals are very lazy. You know, there was a book that I read. I oh, fuck, I can't remember the book it was. I'll think of it and we'll put it on here. But a guy interviewed more Olympic champions, gold medalists, than anybody in the world. He interviewed them in all different sports. And the one common thing they all said in their interview is they didn't class themselves as naturally talented. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was their passion and work ethic that put them on number one. Most naturally talented people, because it came so easy for them, you know, we all remember being in high school, there's a, there's a kid that can just hit the ball and fucking knock it out of the park. And there's old retarded Clinton over there swinging and missing and tripping and falling. So I had to work really hard to hit the fucking ball. This motherfucker just steps up there and knocks it out of the park on his first swing one-handed. He's naturally got a gift. But most naturally gifted people, not all, did not say the word all, but most that came that easy, they don't appreciate it. They've totally. never had to struggle to get it. So to them, it's like, fuck it. Now, when you get a naturally talented guy or girl and they have a severe work ethic, they're unbeatable. Mm -hmm. they're, they're the ones that are just truly unfucking beatable because they've got God-given talent 
and they got a work ethic like a mule, they're just tough to get around. But fuck it, I don't mind being second or third. Yeah. Because I didn't have that, but I'll sure take a second and third behind a naturally gifted, talented person with a hell of a work ethic. Because often you don't find the two are married together. Not all, but most of the time. I totally agree. My husband and I are exactly the same. We both are not naturally talented at anything, but I will outwork fucking anyone. That you can make idea. up for a lot of inadequacies yeah. if you're willing to work. Unbelievable. I totally agree. Okay, so in my space, in my, I live in the online space, the mm -hmm. coaching space. Right. There's this huge kind of... So help me understand just yeah. a smidgen. Yeah, exactly. You're a life coach. Is that what you are? I don't know jack shit about you, That's and I don't right. mean that offensively, no. but I don't want to know a lot about somebody when I talk totally. to them because I want to be able to genuine, authentic. I want to ask them questions. So help me catch up a little bit Absolutely. here. You're a life coach. Yeah, I hate that fucking okay, word. Okay, so what whatever. is the word then? I use confidence in business coach. I help you. Mm -hmm absolutely feel confident in living your your god-given purpose and okay. i help you make a lot of money doing okay, it okay right that is what i feel like i okay so you're kind of consulting with people in their Correct. lives so absolutely. they call you tell you what they want help with and you help them absolutely. with it okay Mind, that, mindset and strategy you right. know how you look to gordon mckinley mm -hmm. and ian and all those people like those were kind of like your mentors right yes I am basically like a paid version of that yes. when someone doesn't have someone naturally in their life like that. Okay. I am the person that helps them go from where they are to where they want to go. And in the space that I exist in, there's a ton, like there's this big trend right now. It used to be what we called bro marketing, like work hard, grind, do all the things. And now it's completely pendulum and I think it's complete bullshit. A lot of it, it's all about the energy, the woo woo, the manifestation, mm -hmm. all the things. I believe in a lot of that. But I, for me, it's God, it's faith, like mm -hmm. the faith part. I have absolutely the hard work, the drive, all of those things, but I also have the faith part in knowing that like if I do my part, there's a whole nother part of the puzzle, which is the faith part. Do you have that? Like, so you're, you've worked your fucking ass off mm -hmm. your whole life to create what you've created, mm -hmm. but do you also believe that there's like a, another part of the show that was more like when when you do your part, the universe, God, source, whatever, does its part? Um, I suppose so. I'm not deeply a religious man. Not that I care if somebody's yeah, religious totally. or not. I don't give a fuck if I go to church or not. It yeah. doesn't bother me. I don't have a dog in the fight. But I do believe everything happens for a reason. Perfect. So whether we're talking about the same thing or not, exactly. uh, my mother was always famous for saying, you know, when one door closes, another one opens. Bingo. So you've just got to be ready for the other one that opens. Most of the time in my life, as much as I hate to admit it, some of the biggest um, slam doors in the face or the, the punch to the gut moments in my life have also led to the greatest door openings Amen. as well. Of thing, you know, I, what originally got me started on down on a horsemanship is I got fired from a job you know i just moved to america had you know fucking four hundred dollars to my name uh no money basically no contacts here no nothing and i get fired from the one and only job i've got and i'm fucked mm -hmm. i got no money like i'm in california thinking about about being homeless so that's what led me to start down under horsemanship and then you know it went on from there but my point is you know i th threw up for three days for christ's sake i'm sick to my stomach i can't eat i'm worried to death etc so at that moment it's pretty horrible but it also leads to an open door, as my mother says. So, you know, as much as we don't, humans try to avoid pain, if you're going through pain, if you're just willing to say, okay, fuck it, this did not quite work out the way I wanted it to work out, but I'm going to go this direction. I, you know, I think the universe will lead you certain places and you'll fight it and you really want to go over here and it just keeps closing doors, closing doors, closing doors, and then this door will open and you'll go down that. That's, you know, like I said, I never wanted to be a clinician. I wanted to be a horse trainer, but I was naturally given, God given talent to teach and I'm very good at it. And that's where money was. So that door was open for me. So I just walked through it. Yeah. So as much as we may want to walk through a different door, if it's closed, it's fucking closed. Yeah. It's locked, you know, so I don't want to, you got to be careful here because then people take that the opposite way and think, okay, it's all about luck and it's all about the opportunity. No, luck is, Ian Francis always says, luck is uh, luck is hard work and opportunity get together and start fucking. Oprah says yeah, that. Yeah, you know what well, I mean? she says it in a different way. <laughs> Oprah says that. 
when opportunity and preparation meet, it's it's uh, it's the opportunity. That, that's yeah. really what luck is: is yeah. when when you're willing to work hard and the right opportunity come yeah. together, and you're willing to marry those two and be committed to it. That's when quote unquote luck happens. So yeah. I'm not. I, I want to be careful that I just don't think we just sit on the couch and wait for the open Correct. door. You got to fucking start walking Amen. and try to pick a direction. And then, you know, go from there. Yeah. Does I that totally, answer that question? No, absolutely. I totally agree because I just get sick and tired of, like, the woo-woo and it's all in your head and the belief and all the things. There's so much action behind it. I've worked, you know, I, I know you don't want to know much about me, but I was in the golf industry and mm -hmm. I hosted corporate and charity golf events. Very rich, rich people yep. hired me to play golf with their executives. I was very good at it. And I've been around extremely successful people, billionaires, all the things, and one of the things that I know is there's not one of those guys who have ever sat on their couch and hoped that they, they got yes. it. You know what I mean? It's, it's a combination of the both. You know, one thing that you have said is that you did, the thing that you were best at, maybe it wasn't being a clinician, but the best thing that you did was the marketing side of it. Mm -hmm. I look at everything, so I'm my whole brand is around confidence, right? I believe confidence is the key to everything. Mm -hmm. You talk about it as marketing. I think the thing that, and correct me if I'm wrong or tell me if this feels true, but like, I think you were really, really confident in what you were able to do, and that mm -hmm. showed through your marketing. Like you became the best, not because maybe you had you were the best in the world at it, but you were so confident in your marketing. You were so confident in the programs that you had. Do you think that's true? Yes, yes. Um, some people call it arrogance. Some people totally. call it cockiness. I don't. I've never seen a successful man that wasn't somewhat arrogant, somewhat cocky. I see lots of losers, no confidence. Lo losers everything. sit on the couch playing video games don't have any confidence mm -hmm. they're not arrogant mm -hmm. you get what I'm trying to say so so yeah you've got to have some arrogance and you've got to have some cockiness and you've got to have some I believe in yourself because fuck it nobody else will if you don't believe in yourself the world's just full of people who want to knock you down okay so again take negative energy the people that tried to knock me down like m as many people in the world that have told me I was never going to be a clinician I was you know when I left high school at 15 Everybody but my parents told me it was a stupid thing to do. My parents, of all people, said that was a smart decision. You know what I mean? And now you'd think your parents are the ones telling you to stay in school. Now, with that being said, I'm not telling every 15-year-old kid to fucking leave, uh, leave school at 15. I, I was a freak of nature, okay? That's, that, I didn't realize it till now I've got later in life that I realized what I was is not quite right, okay? It's kind of weird. But me having confidence at 15, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I was good at it. A and my whole life in school, I was always an average motherfucking athlete. I was always the kid that was middle of the pack in every sport. I wasn't the last one, but sure as shit weren't even close to the front. When I came across horses, I felt like that was something I could be number one at. I felt like I could be great at because I had a passion for it. It lit me on fire. If I could have identified, if I could have had the same passion for academics in school, shit, I could have really done a lot with academic. You know what I mean? But I was never, I was bored to sh shitless in school. I hated school because I didn't have the passion for it. So I've always had that confidence. But I, I, um, it's hard for me to identify with young people that say, I don't know what I want to do, mm -hmm. and I don't know what I should do. And, it's, it, and I'm not saying they're lying, but it's just hard for me to identify with it because I always knew. Mm -hmm. I always knew. Once I figured out you could get paid to fuck with a horse, it was game over. <laughs> like, I just thought we were doing it for fun, and then some asshole said, you can get paid to do this. I was like, what the fuck? You said I could get paid to do this? Then it was like full on. At yeah. that point, I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Because I just thought this was fun shit. I had no idea we could make money doing this. Yeah. And so when I told my guidance counselor at high school that I was leaving high school at 15, of course, that every teacher, every person in the world, you're doing the wrong thing, you're going to fuck up your life, blah, blah. And I'd bring in the American magazines and try to show them the horse industry and people do this for a living and blah, blah, blah. And you know, try to prove to them that this is not just a boyhood dream. This is actually an industry. And in their defense, I don't blame them for saying what they say, okay? I don't, I don't blame them or hold a grudge against them because now that I'm 47, I've had 10,000 young people sit in front of me and tell me they want to be number one and as soon as things got a little fucking difficult, they quit. You know what I mean? So they probably used to that type of stuff. But So I've always had the confidence to go do it. Um, uh, I just think that's either in you or it's not. My parents always were very positive to me and my sister, but my sister's very quiet too. She's the opposite of me. Probably has a little lack of confidence, quiet, 
respectful, meek, you know what I mean, doesn't push the limit, and then there's fucking crazy Clinton. You yeah. know what I mean? We were both raised the same way. So yeah. I truly believe, like, I believe a lot of it comes down to the color code that I believe in, you know, red, yellow, blue, so and so So the color code is exactly what now everyone's calling the Enneagram. Have you heard of the no, Enneagram? Never. It's exactly the same thing. It's like a number. And when you've explained the color code, I'm like, oh, that's the Enneagram. Yeah. Like, you're probably a three. I'm a three. Or maybe like an eight. It depends on how you're motivated, right? Yeah. Like, are, is it external validation? Is it like motivated by power? And you know, my husband is an Enneagram one. He is just like very by the book. He follows all the rules. Like if he, so like, let's say we get like a, we got this chair delivered mm -hmm. to the house and we had to build it. I'm like, okay, fuck it, let's just build this shit. And like the three extra pieces, yeah. my husband wants wants to read all the directions, yes. and know everything is happening, and wants <laughs> all the information. And I'm like, oh my god, let's just do this. See, it's in a night. Yeah. You can't teach that. It's but either in or it's not. I think confidence. I've always said confidence is like a muscle the more you use it the stronger it becomes every single time you made a decision in the horse industry to you know start the first videos or do the first subscription or do whatever you did to become the Clinton Anderson of mm -hmm. the horse industry every time you made one of those decisions don't you think your confidence grew I think that's oh yeah yeah I think that that's what confidence is I think people say they don't have confidence I'm like you're not fucking taking any action the minute you take an action and then another action and then another action it doesn't even matter if you get your ass kicked it's just that your willingness to try mm -hmm. like your willingness to show up and every time you do that you become more confident that, that, that is all true I'm not gonna say it's not but you've also got to remember that for people like like I would describe you as a red, red in the color code, reds are motivated by power. Yep. They they gold they they're driven, gold gold orientated, take no prisoners, build the fucking bridge, move on, okay, and so forth. They're just accomplished people. They build businesses and empires, okay. So for us reds, what you just said is second nature. It makes total logic. Mm -hmm. But if you get a, a a white color code, a guy and their white's motivated by peace. So when you're whatever you said, it could be another number, but they're motivated is peace mm -hmm. they don't want trouble yep. so to a white to stick their neck out and take a chance take a gamble say something offensive you know what I mean like what do you think you address a white a white color code is gonna say I think it looks great yeah. he could think it's the most hideous fucking dress in the world but if you ask me being a red I'm gonna say oh. I either say I love it or I fucking hate it. I can't help myself. I have to tell you what I think. But to that other color code, that's dangerous territory. So confidence to that type of person is very hard. And that's been very difficult for me to identify with that person. Because in my color chart, I'm 66% red, 24% yellow, 13% blue, and like no white. So for me to identify with a white color code is like completely foreign. I've got none in me, no, which is patience. Whites are very patient, forgiving, logical, but they're not. Lie, white personalities will lie to you more than any other color code because they don't want to offend you. So they will hedge, they will sit in, I always have a saying, when you sit in the middle of the fence, you get splinters in your ass. Indecision pick, is still Pick a, a fucking team. Yep. Where whites never want to pick a team. They always want to stay down the middle so they can hedge their bet left and right, depending on the situation. So yes, confidence is a muscle and the more you use it, the better you get. But I also say that to some other colors, blues too, Blues lack a lot of confidence. You know, they're driven by intimacy, okay? Yellows, they fucking yap all day. They, they have confidence coming out their ass. They have so much goddamn confidence, they shouldn't have the confidence, okay? <laughs> but they pull it off. And reds do. But, you know, I was always a firm believer, and I'm wrong now, but for many years, I thought that I could train kids to be a certain way. Like, I felt like, okay, this kid's not a real go-getter. He's kind of lazy. He's not real motivated. He's not a good talker. He, you know, he's not very structured. That's all right. I'll fucking get him around me. I'll chaperone him for three years. I'll mentor him. I'll kick him in the ass. I'll get him going and get him successful. And I did. I got lots of, dozens and dozens of young people very successful. But here's the mistake I made. When they left my ranch and I'd set them up, with the goals, what they had to do, the, uh, got good habits formed, etc. I was too naive to believe they'll stay that way. They don't. People go back to what they are. It just, basically what I'm politely trying to say is when I took my foot out of their ass, when I didn't tell them when to shit, when to get up, when to go to fucking bed, how to talk to a customer, how to hustle a deal, how to put a deal together. When I stopped giving them the structure, even though I felt like they could do it on their own and I left them, and when I left them, I leave them out. You know, they can come back to me anytime they want, but I don't micromanage them. 
most of them went back to what they were when they started. So for a go-getting kid when they started, they stayed a go-getting kid. Mm -hmm. A very lazy motherfucker when I got my hands on them, they eventually went back to being a lazy motherfucker. So I don't believe in me anymore that you can make people a certain way. It's either in them and they want it or they don't. You can fake it while you structure them. Because I was like a drill sergeant. They lived on my ranch, they worked with me 24 seven, they traveled with me, etc. So I instilled a lot of things that made them successful. And they were probably successful for the first year, then they dropped down a little less the next year, then a little less and a little less. And eventually, I'm not saying they end up being homeless and a bum, but they, they never lived up to what I thought they could have done. And they were capable of doing. So I don't, I think I always, now what I believe is people are what they are. If they start fucking with passion, they'll stay with passion. But you can only light a fire under their ass so much. They have to, you have to be part of your own fucking rescue. So I think I kind of agree with that. And I always talk about things called stop losses. I put in stop losses in my life to make sure my life stays at a very high level. So I have a coach, I have a therapist, I have a trainer, I have someone who cooks for us. Mm -hmm. I have like all of the things because I want to live life up here. And that's why I tell like a lot of my clients, I was like, if you aren't going to be the person who goes to the gym, fucking have a trainer to make sure you go to the gym for yes. the rest of your life. If you need someone to like light a fire under your ass, if you need Clinton's boot in your ass for the rest of your life in order to live up to your excellence in mm -hmm. life, you better figure out how to have that boot in your ass for the rest of your life. Yes. I'm a hundred percent like I'm and so that would be that's it. part of recognizing what your weaknesses Correct. are Absolutely. and using them to your advantage. Absolutely. You know, some of the most gifted public speakers I've ever met have had one thing in common. You know what it is? They're dyslexic. Mm. They can't read. Really? And most people that I've met that are dyslexic, not all, I'm not gonna use the word all, but a lot of them that have been dyslexic were excellent public speakers mm -hmm. because they had to rely on their bullshitting school skills to get by in school. Yeah. In school, they couldn't read. Kids that can't read very well hide. They make excuses, they hide, they go to the bathroom when it's their term to read out loud. I'm a little bit the same way. I'm not dyslexic, but I'm very uneducated book smart wise. You know, I can read and see, but when I have to, like when I do a, like people ask me, do I script all the shit that I do? No, I just completely fucking wing it. Yeah. Because when I have to speak into a camera and literally read certain lines, it's like hooked on phonics. I mean, it's fucked up. I sound like a third grader. Boy said jump, green ham. Like that's how I sound when I have to fucking read something. I just completely lose my shit. Now, if you give me a bullet point and say, make up three sentences about your dress, I'll fucking wing it and I, I'll knock it out two or three times and I'll get it. Yeah. But if I have to read, say these 10 words about your dress, I sound like I'm in the third grade. You know what I mean? So I think that you, again, your, your greatest weakness is your greatest strength and your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. Yeah. So, so, I just think if that's what people need is to identify, I've always felt like the quicker you can just identify what your weaknesses are and not be ashamed of them, but embrace the motherfuckers, the quicker you'll get over them or improve them. You may not ever get over them, but you sure as shit can know their weaknesses. Does, does that make sense? Totally. And know, uh, you know, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, you know, it's like Rochelle that you met that, you know, she, she's my writer for 15 years. Yeah. She has, she does all of my social media. I don't have password. I don't have any social media of my own private life, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm kind of weird about that. I like my private life to be my private life as a general rule. But all of my social media is through Down Under Horsemanship. For 15 years, she's run my social media. I don't have passwords. I don't have accounts. You know why? Because I know it's a weakness. Because I'll be drinking at 1 o'clock in the morning and some mouthy bitch will say something stupid about me and I'll fucking get on there and tell her what I think and my career's over. Yeah. How many celebrities every week get taken down, yeah. cancelled, because they say something fucking stupid, drunk or high, and they start it again? So again, I know my weakness is, if I get to drinking and I'm pissed off, I'll probably say something I might regret. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Recognize it's a fucking weakness and build a barrier. Mm -hmm. So that's what Rochelle is. So I'll send Rochelle 10 social media posts a week. Nine and a half out of 10 will never see the light of day. Mm -hmm. Because she knows what to filter and what not to. I just send her lots of things that I think are fucking funny. And she says, nope, 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 no. Nope. I'll give you that one okay. as a token. But that, I laugh at it. I own the fucking company. Yeah. But she technically runs it. Well, that's your stop loss. You know, because uh, I know where my weakness is. But most people I've found, and, and again, I struggle to know why, 
Don't do that. I've always thought it's, it's always come instinctively to me to know what your weaknesses are and identify them and work on them. Or what, what do you call stop loss? Is that what you I, call it? I call it a stop loss. You put, you put Rochelle in. Yes. To stop. Me from fucking it correct. up. Correct. Exactly. Yes, but that's, but now, but I don't have to worry about it now. Exactly. Because she does it. Exactly. So, so, but most people will not self-reflect enough to want to do that. And I don't know why. It's been natural to me. Nobody's taught me to do it, but they won't. I don't know why, to I'm be honest. I'm possessed to live life to the absolute highest. Like, I am possessed to have the best experience on this planet ever. Mm -hmm. And so I just figure out how to have the best fucking experience, and I'll do whatever it takes in order to have that because I literally am so grateful for my life every single day, even if it's a goat rodeo behind the scenes and mm -hmm. like complete dumpster fire. Yep. I just am so fucking passionate about having the greatest life ever. So I'll just figure out how to do whatever it takes in order to do that. And so if that you have to hire certain people or do certain things, I'm obsessed with it. Um, I want to switch gears because something sure. that I suit, like I'm super like excited about to talk to you because mm -hmm. you are changing or do you have a goal, and I think you do, have a goal to change the way the horse industry thinks about money? Because you're so passionate. Like, that's the one thing that, I, like, really hooked me. Because I think women in general have a really hard time commanding what they're worth, like, money-wise. Mm -hmm. And I think in the horse industry, correct me if I'm wrong, same exact shit. Like, you talk about, like, they just love being poor. Because yeah. they, like, literally are afraid to charge what they're worth. Like, it drives me up the wall. And women in general... Like, in general, not everyone, and it's starting to change, and that's, like, why I'm so passionate about what I get to do, too. But, like, in general, people are afraid to charge money, and money is just an ass. Like, money is just a tool, right? Mm -hmm. It just makes you more of who you are. So are you are you on, like, some sort of, like, mission to change it in the, in the horse industry, or is it, like, just, like, you're living your life and hopefully people understand it, or what's that mm -hmm. like? I wouldn't call it a mission, but I'd sure want them to stop being broke. I've seen a lot of really good horsemen, and Gordon McKinley, my mentor, was one of them, that kind of somewhat died broke. Yeah. They're good people. They, they got good work ethic. They got good morals, you know. They got great things in life going on, but they were just such piss-poor businessmen. Yeah. They were so piss-poor with money that they, they just literally, and they never thought about the future. So when they got to 65 and they realized their body was fucked up and they were crippled, because horse trainers are a lot like sports athletes. athletes. Even though they're not on TV making millions, it's very tough on their body. So it's physically demanding their vertebrae every fucking day is going bang, 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 10 hours a day. So, so they don't think about what am I going to do when my body's banged up? What am I going to do when I'm tired? What am I going to do when I'm burnt out? They don't think about that as an industry until they get like that. So I'm just trying to bring awareness to it. And probably that's one of the biggest thing takeaways that I got from those two. Those two things of the gauge were a typical part of my life. I just do shit and doors open. Totally. That's why we're sitting that's here. Why, but that's what I'm telling you about the energy part. That's what yeah. I'm talking about, like the God source. Yeah, I would never whatever. have done a podcast exactly. in a million years without the gauge. Because exactly. so many people walked up to me in the gauge and said, we loved it. We laughed our ass off. We had a great time. Please do more of yeah. it. And that's eventually, I heard enough of that. I said, oh, fuck it. Let's go do it and have some fun with it. I'm here, sitting here now. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just don't want to see them broke and destitute. Uh, some of that is my own personal fear. I think maybe because I don't have any family here. You know, do, I, don't, I do not have any children. None of my direct family live here. My parents are, are in their 70s now. That, and my sister lives in Australia. She's five years older than me. So, you know, if, if world goes the way it should, they'll all die theoretically before me. I might go before them. But I'm kind of here on my own. So I have a little bit of a quote-unquote fear of dying alone not so much the alone part but dying broke mm -hmm. dying where you can't get medicine dying without shelter over your head you know that i don't know why I, so that's some of my reason of working so hard because there's no fucking plan b with me mm -hmm. there was no trust fund there was no inheritance there was no if this doesn't work motherfucker you're in a strange country by yourself get your shit together yeah i can't just pack up and say mom dad you mind if i come over the weekend my dad distinctly told me this when i left high school at 15 when i walked out the door he distinctly told me we're going to support you in leaving high school but you're never coming back. You understand this. You can come back for Christmas and your birthday, but that's fucking it. Yeah. You don't live here anymore. I'm glad he told me that. Mm -hmm. If he would have said, son, if it don't work out, you can come on back here. Maybe my life would have been a little different. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't have been. But I sure as shit didn't think that was a fucking plan B. 
Yeah. Going home wasn't an option for me. Swim or drown, motherfucker. Yeah. That was it. So that's your motivation there. You know, is, is you're out on your own now. So when you're in a strange country, theoretically by yourself and no blood relatives here, it can get a little fucking lonely from time to time. You know, I have millions of acquaintances and very few friends. Yeah. You get what I'm trying to say? So, so I've always had that drive that, okay, at the very least, when I'm 90, I want to be in a nursing home and some bitch power washes me with lukewarm water. <laughs> I know all old people get abused in nursing homes. <laughs> bitch, you can, you. <laughs> you can abuse me, but just power wash me with lukewarm water. I'm probably not going to get the hot stuff, but please don't power wash me with the fucking cold shit and I freeze to death. You know what I mean? So that's my plan B is that when I really get old, Okay, and all my really close friends are 20 years older than me. I've always been attracted to older people. I'm fucking on my own. Yeah. So I gotta make sure somebody's there to fucking power wash me when I shit myself and I'm not sitting there. You know, I, I'm frightened to death of old people's homes because there's a lot of fucked up things that go on there. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so I don't want to see horse trainers broke and old and run down. And I've just seen so many of them die like that. And uh, I just didn't want to see it. And every horse trainer that walked up to me from those Gage podcasts said, I raise my prices, anybody drop out? No. Raise my prices, anybody unhappy? No. So how did you have the guts in the beginning? Because this is the part that I want everyone to listen to. How did you have the balls, the guts, whatever you want to call it, to charge more than the industry standard that was, you said, set for 100 years? Because that's where everyone, like people all the time, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous to charge this, I'm nervous to charge this. And how did you have the guts to do it? Like, what was it inside of you that are like, I am gonna charge, I don't even know how much, like mm -hmm. $1,000 an hour opposed to $50 an hour or whatever it costed. Like, where did that come from? How did you have the guts to do it? What told you you were able to do that? I think number one, it comes from just confidence and knowing you can get the job done yeah. uh, and believing in yourself. So I'd say that's probably the start. Number two, um, Experience gives you confidence. So if you've repeated this several times with several successes, you want to do it more. But there's a ton of guys who've done it before you. I think, still I think my bucks. biggest thing in life is, I've always thought like this, and I don't know why, but it's served me well. If everybody walks, I fucking run. Yeah. And if everybody's running, I fucking walk. Yeah. You get what I'm trying to say? So in the last two years, when the housing move, um, market's booming and, and prices are going up, I'm saving cash. Mm -hmm. So now that we're starting to hit a recession and housing prices go down, I'm sitting on a pile of fucking cash to start buying. Amen. I do the opposite of everybody else. So when everybody else is buying shit, I'm saving cash. When everybody's selling this shit, I'm buying it up. So I've always just tried to do the opposite. So if everybody's charging this much, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the opposite of that. But really, the, the cool thing about America, it's the greatest fucking country in the world. Amen. It, it is the greatest fucking country Amen. in the world. And me and you being foreigners, you said you're from Canada? Originally okay. from Canada, yeah. But, but I'm an American it's easy citizen. For, <laughs> yes, and I am too. But it's easy for foreigners to really appreciate how great this country is because we know that there's a lot of other countries in the world that aren't so great. There's a lot of people that are born here but have no fucking idea how great this truly country is. But, but so... So when you, when you know how great, there's enough rich people in America that if you're willing to provide a high-end service and, and really over-deliver, so my theory has always been if you charge, say, $100, make sure they walk away with $120 worth of service, whether that's $1,000 or a million, whatever the dollar figure is. I always want people to feel like they were fucking me just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I always want people to walk away thinking, he fucking gave me more than what he, what he told me he was going to charge, or I gave extra service. There's enough wealthy people here, um, excuse me, that will pay for service. They will pay for a great service. So I realized I didn't want to be the Walmart, okay, I wanted to be the Mercedes Benz. Mm -hmm. Low numbers, high, uh, you know, low, no low volume, but high charge a lot rather than Walmart makes a little bit of money but off thousands and thousands of products. So kind of pick which pool you want to play in. Not that Walmart's wrong, they make a lot of fucking money. Both pools are correct, but you kind of have to pick which one you want to be. You can't be fucking Mercedes, but then knock out thousands of vehicles like Toyota. Yeah. You, you, got, you get what I'm saying? You can't be a custom home builder, but then knock out 400 homes a year. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. You're either a spec home builder and quality goes down, but volume's up. 
or custom home builder, you're building five homes, but the quality's through the roof. So you gotta kind of pick which one of them you wanna be. And I'm not saying one's necessarily better than the other by any means, but I've always been drawn to the quality aspect of it. You know, that, that movie, Ford versus Ferrari, I could very much identify with the Ferrari's mindset on that. I always wanted the best. I'm willing to save for the best, work for the best. I couldn't afford it for many, many years, but I was always willing to wait till I could afford it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't really know. I, I, just, I just feel like there's enough people here that if you do a really good job, they will fucking pay for it. Absolutely. There's, what, 300 and something million, million Americans people. in this country. There's shit tons of money, especially right now. Like, I think with the, like, the recession coming up, everyone's getting scared. I actually get so fucking excited because mm -hmm. everyone else is like, it's kind of like when the pandemic happened. I remember specifically, I lost like $120,000 worth of work in like one day yeah. due to events being canceled and stuff like that. And I cried for about yeah. a week. And then I was like, holy fuck, I am about to lap some bitches. Like yeah. I am about to lap some people because I just went double down. When people were watching Netflix, I was like, fuck you. I'm a literally, yes. and I made up five times that by just kind of having that mindset. And I actually think in the recession, it's the exact time again where people are getting scared. Like like you said, that's a Warren Buffett quote. When people are, um, when people are scared, be greedy. When people are greedy, be scared. Yes. That's exactly the mentality that... Like the horse market right now is really fucking high. Prices of horses now historically have been as high as they've ever been. Okay. I'm not buying any this yeah. year. I'm gonna wait to see if the market will drop like the and then market. I'll buy some. Yeah. Okay, but I'm not gonna buy when it's high. Okay, so I don't know if that answered your question about price, but I just, I just think there's enough people that'll pay for service. Um, you know, the biggest thing that I really noticed about America, you know, when you come from a, a foreign country to America, or any, you go from one country to another, you get to see a different cultural change because it's not your world. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're all humans, of course, but there's cultures of every, you know, every country's got culture to it, okay? And the one thing that stood out in my mind that I'll never forget uh, is the work ethic part really fucking hit home for me. And to me, it's the most boring thing people want to hear. They want to hear this. You do, but people want to hear these 10 fucking magic ingredients to exactly. be successful. And, and they'll rather pay for those 10, but you'll offer them the most important one the one that's the most important, they'll get you the furthest, and you offer up for free, which is fucking work hard, they don't want to hear it. Like when I first came to America, I'd do clinics, and this is back in the day where I don't have any employees, it's fucking me, okay? You could have hired me for $400 a day, I would have fucking swept your house, I didn't give a fuck. Okay, but $400 a day, I charge 10,000 a day now to do the same shit, I'll still sweep your house for 10 grand. You know what I mean? I, I'm a whore, I'll do whatever for money, okay? But it just went from 400 to 10,000, okay? I love it. So, but, but when I, when I would do clinics, I would work all day. I typically work through lunch or grab a sandwich, quickly eat it and go on. And I'd start at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, finish eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, whenever. I always had a theory. I'm gonna be the last, I'm gonna be the first motherfucker in the arena and the last one to leave. And I want every paying customer to beg for me to stop. When the last person says, we've had enough, we're good with that, that means I've given them more than what they paid for. Well, pretty soon I would have people walk up to me at clinics and say, oh my God, you're the hardest working man I've ever seen and I've never seen anybody work like you and this is amazing. I'll be honest, you know, at 21 years old, I was kind of naive and green, but I kind of thought they were fucking with me just a little bit. When they'd say that, I'd be like, is this bitch fucking with me? Like, is she really being real or she's kind of, you know, just making fun of me here? And, but it kept happening and happening and happening. And when people would say this to me, I'd literally look at them and, and here's what I'd think in my mind. I'd say some stupid shit like, well, thank you very much, I try my best. And what I'm, I'm really thinking is, bitch, you ain't seen nothing. This ain't fucking hard. What I did in Australia was fucking hard. There ain't no fucking Mexicans cleaning stalls in Australia. You're the motherfucking <laughs> Mexican. You're the slave. You're the person doing all the hard shit. Yeah. You know, this ain't hard. Working from seven in the morning to eight or nine at night, that ain't fucking hard. That's a normal day. My parents, this is where I got this from, for most of my childhood until 15 when I left high school, they had a milk run in Australia, which is, I think you used to have in America where they deliver the milk and paper to people's houses. I don't see it anymore, but I don't even know if it's around in America anymore, but it used to be years ago. And in Australia, it's still there, what it was 20 years ago. They, they got up at, at like 2.15 in the morning, got to their milk van at 3 a.m. They work from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. delivering milk and paper. They take their work clothes, their clothes to work. 
they'd shower shit and shave at their day jobs, be at their day jobs, and they'd work their day jobs from eight in the morning to five or six o'clock at night. They did that six days a week. That's what I grew up seeing. Yeah. They did that to provide me and my sister a try to be of a better way of life, a better, better quality of life, you know, try to grow their income and so forth. Does that make sense? Absolutely. But that's all I ever fucking knew. Imagine start getting up at 2.30 every fucking morning for six days a week and working until five or six o'clock in the afternoon doing that six days a week for years, not a year, like a decade or two, like a long time. Like, it, it, I find it funny, you know, a lot of people want to throw shit at, at other uh, nationalities, the, the fucking Indians or the Chinese or the Mexicans, whatever the fuck, whatever it is, I don't give a fuck. Let's take Indians and hotels, okay? Reach out to my buddy Bobby, okay? The fucking Indians and the, and the, and the hotels, okay? It, yeah, everybody wants to make fun of the, why the fucking Indians own every goddamn seven, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven and fucking every cheap-ass hotel in the world. You know why? Because they're willing to put 70,000 fucking people in one room. They're willing to have seven families live in 700 feet. Mm -hmm. They're willing to fucking do whatever it takes. You knock on the door at 2.30 in the morning to get a hotel room. When I was poor, that's where I fucking stayed. Though, you know, Super 8, the cheapest motherfucking hotels you could find. So when I rocked up there at 2.30 in the morning to get a room, guess who came out of the back? The guy that owned it, the Indian guy. Smelt like fucking curry, but he walked out there, motherfucker. He's serving me at 2.30 in the morning in his pajamas because he's too cheap to fucking hire a girl to sit there during those hours of the night. That's why they're rich. Because mm -hmm. they're willing to do shit that most people in the world are not willing to do. Am I willing to do that now at my age? Fuck no, I'm not. But I don't have to anymore. I already did it. You've earned I've earned the right to be a lazy yeah. motherfucker now. Yeah. But I did that for many, many fucking years. But that's why most immigrants work like that because where they came from, here is like a piece of cake yeah. compared to the shit that they had to do to work, to make a living, to feed their fucking kids. So again, the most important asset to becoming a successful businessman or person in life is actually the most boring advice you could give them. It's just fucking work hard. They want you to say 10 other things and they're willing to pay you a lot. But the one that's free, again, you get sweat every day. You get more of it the next day. So, and nobody ever drowned in their own sweat. I've seen thousands of people fail through laziness. I've seen thousands of people fail through lack of dedication. But I've never seen one motherfucking fail in any sort of venture in life through lack of hard work. That's the one thing I've never seen is that one. I love it. I, and I'm so, so thankful that you're saying that because, again, in our space, there's just so many people selling the magic bullet, the pot of gold, the thing at the end of the rainbow, the secret that no one else knows. And the secret is fucking work hard, be consistent. Sacrifice. Yeah, and be consistent. Okay, talk about sacrifice there. One thing that I've heard you say is that you've sacrificed, and you have sacrificed a lot in your life. You know, another thing that we have in common is I chose not to have children as well. Most people just assume that I can't, but it was definitely a decision mm -hmm. that I, I did not want to have children. But I am, again, I think it's probably just because I'm so passionate mm -hmm. about, like, working hard. Do you have, like, do you have regrets about what you did? And you, because you gave up relationships, you gave up mm -hmm. having children, you've given up a lot in your life in order to the, have the success that you have. And I don't think it's bad or good. I just think that people have to decide what they actually want. Um, I don't have any regrets about that. I can't say, you know, I, I, only, use, I only say never twice. I'm never going to get married and I'm never going to suck a dick. They're the only two things I won't do. And if you suck dick out there, good luck to you. Get on your knees and suck that dick, <laughs> motherfucker. I, I have no dog in a fight. But they're the only thing, two things I say never to. I'll never get married again. i never suck dick. But so I can't say I never will regret not having children or not getting married, you know, these other things, but I don't right now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't right now. The only thing I actually regret in my fucking career is I didn't pay enough attention to the money. Yeah. That's the only one regret I have. Um, Tell you know. us about that line. I actually used it with a client the other day. You said, if you don't inspect it, they'll only show up to um, the Yeah, tell us. Employees will do what you inspect, not expect. Yeah. Now, when I say employees, I'm talking like fucking 18 out of 20. Two will, 
like Rochelle that you met, mm -hmm. she will do what I expect, whether I inspect it or not. Mm -hmm. That's why we get along so great, because I'm the perfect fucking boss. I'm the boss she has that gives her unlimited credit card, whatever the fuck she wants to do, but she's the greatest employee because I don't have to check on her. If she's got a deadline that has to be done by Monday morning, I know if she's late, she'll work all day, all night, all weekend, she will not miss that deadline. Mm -hmm. Whether I inspect it or not, that deadline will get fucking met. But that's two of the 20. She's the rare individual. The other fucking nine out of 10, they will only do what you inspect. So that when they know you're not gonna inspect their work, inspect the deadline, expect the quality, inspect it, they won't do it. So, you know, another saying I always say is, and this is where I really fucked up, this, this part I have to, I've always admitted my fuck ups because I, I think they're funny in some ways and I hope people learn from them. Don't make it easy for people to steal from you. I made it way too easy for people to steal from me. One of the negatives of being raised with good mother and father, I had good, great mother and father with great work ethic, middle class Australia, um, you know, you don't steal, you don't cheat, you get your ass beat if you do it as a kid. As kids, we all fucking steal some candy. We all do some stupid shit as kids and, and hopefully you get your ass beat for it and you learn the lessons and your parents sit you down, blah, blah. But one of the fucking negatives of being raised with good, honest people and you don't steal and you don't do this shit is that you naively think everybody else is like that. You know what I mean? You naively think everybody else thinks the way you do and they fucking don't especially when it comes to money. So a lot of the money that I had stolen from me and embezzled and all kinds of shit, ultimately it was my fault because I made it easy for them. You know, I left the safe door open, theoretically, yeah. as a metaphor, I left the safe door open. To me, you could put your purse here and fucking 20 grand sticking out of it, and I might see it there, but it would never fucking compute with my head at all that when you go to sit down and take a piss, I should take some money out of there. Yeah. It would never even... But because I thought like that, I was naive enough to believe that most humans think like that, and I don't think they do. I think maybe half do. I think half the humans in the world wouldn't take the money, and I think the other half would fucking rob you blind in a heartbeat if they had a chance to get away with it and they thought they wouldn't get caught. So my only regret is not paying attention to the money the way I do now. If I would have paid attention to the money where I sign my own checks, I check my own credit, uh, check credit card ca uh, balances now, etc. I check all that now. If I would have had that mentality 15 years ago, fuck, there wouldn't have been enough banks to hold the money. But, but I had to learn that lesson the hard way. So that's why I talk about this shit, because I want people to don't, don't fuck up like I fucked up. I've done some great things, but I fucked a lot of things up. And I want people to learn from that. So that, I don't have any regrets in my career, children, not children. My business was my child. And I'm proud of it. It was successful. It changed the world. You, some people will say that's fucking arrogant. But in the horse world, I changed the world in horsemanship. Okay? I might not be the greatest competitor. In fact, I'm an average competitor. As far as competitors go, like I compete now, I get my ass whipped all the time. But I enjoy the process. I enjoy playing the game. Does that make sense? But I'm not... Now, if I would have dedicated myself 25 years ago to being a competitor the way that the, the guys do now that are winning, I think I could have won because I was hungry and I was fucking dangerous and I was an animal, but I'm not that now because I know there's a price to be paid for success and I'm not willing to pay that price anymore just with, you call it age or wisdom or slowing down, whatever, but I, all, I just know that too. There's, there's a price to pay and I don't want to pay that price. I want to enjoy the second half of my life and work a little less hard. So. I don't have any regrets. Um, would I wished I would have been a competitor? Yes, but ultimately I'd be broke now. Yeah. There's very few people in the horse industry that are really, really competitive and won a lot that even remotely are successful financially. I'm not saying they're not out there, but it's fucking rare. Yeah. I could count on two fingers in the reigning world that of guys that or girls that have been financially got their shit together from their industry. The vast majority of them are fucking broke. Now, they'll be driving a 5,000 truck and trailer and act like they got millions, but they're fucking broke, yeah. okay? So I would not have the lifestyle I have now if I wouldn't have picked this different path. So part of me says, man, I wish I would have come in a competitor, but I, even with me with having a good business sense, I wouldn't have had the money I have now. Yeah. So I have a lifestyle now that I can appreciate because I went a different direction. What gets you fired up now? Like, what do you do on a daily basis? Like, what? Uh, I get up and I go to the gym. I get up at like 4.40 and I'm usually at the gym at five o'clock or a little bit past five, 10 past five. I walk out, 
Um, I go home, I have breakfast, I usually go to the barn at 8, and I try to leave the barn somewhere between 4 and 6 p.m., just leave the barn, okay? Um, but I, you enjoy the barn Yes, stuff? yes, I okay. enjoy the barn because I'm only training horses for people I like. I'm only training people for horses for people that don't give me a hard time, they let me do what I want. It's pretty much like I own the horses anyway. So I, I'm allergic to dickheads now. I can't, I, I'm very much allergic to fucking idiots now. I can't handle them, I can't handle being around them. They just drain, like I used to have this sticker on my fridge that says I used to be a people person but people fucked that up for me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I used to be a people person, but people fucked that up for me. So when you're in a people business, yeah. they can fucking drain the shit out of yeah. you if you're not careful. Yeah. And, and you know, policemen, nurses, any of those industries where you're dealing with the public a lot. After yeah. 25 years, you have a right to be a cranky motherfucker. Yeah. You have a right to want to blow your fucking brains out because people... Uh, you know, people can suck the life out of you if, you don't, if you're not very careful. So I'm very careful now. Like, I have a little... Um, sticker thing that Rochelle made me and, and laminated and on my mirror in my bathroom it says are you getting positive energy from this person yeah if no get rid of them immediately yeah so that's my motto in life now if I don't get positive energy from being around them if you don't feel better than when you leave than this when you is showed up. boyfriends girlfriends it. work associates anybody yeah. get rid of them now again when you're before you get retired that's not so much a luxury it might be for your friends and your personal life but your business life most people that you make money from fucking are draining as a good rule of thumb that's why you, they pay you because if they weren't paying you you wouldn't fucking do it let's just be honest okay so so i get to follow that rule now that's what people ask me what's the greatest thing about being retired what the money gives you is freedom it's not even what the money, you know, the money itself. What the money does is give you a chance to say, no, I don't want to fuck with you today, or yes, I do. That's the greatest gift of retirement right there, is knowing who you want to fuck with every day and not having to fuck with any if you don't want to be.